All right, you ready? Yeah. I'm gonna, this is weird. I'm, I'm not looking at the screen. I'm looking at a camera. Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of That SEC Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm joined, as always, by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Vols on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, man, alive. This is a weird one. I got to be honest with you. You can't see me. You can't see Shane just yet. Uh, no surprise. He's got all the equipment, but he has yet to figure out how to plug it in. <laughs> Oh, my. Well, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's uh, actually more of an Internet thing. Uh, Hopefully here within the next week or two, uh, the other half of this video will be uploaded and then we'll be uh, we'll be man, 100 percent YouTube. I mean, we're still going to have the podcast. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it's just going to be a little bit different because we'll have visual aids. So, yeah, man, uh, you look great. (laughs) I'm assuming. (laughs) I Thank got the podcast all. shirt on and everything, man. I'm supporting the show. And, uh, you know, if you're just listening, it, it, sorry, we're, we're, you're probably in the dark wondering what in the hell we're talking about. We are officially recording this thing on YouTube live. Uh, go and check the YouTube out, channel out. That's why we've been trying to, to build that up. And uh, I promised a big announcement. And here it is, man. So I've quit my job. This, oh. is, this is my job from now on out. Just the podcast. I'm going to focus all my energy on doing that. Uh, Nothing bad happened with Saturday Down South. Very thankful for all the time and years and just what I was able to learn and the, uh, you know, working relationships I had over there. But, you know, the only negative I I would say was, uh, you know, at times they would request that I not share the podcast and don't tweet about it and uh, maybe don't publicize it like as much as I'd like to. And so... Mm -hmm. Hey, if anybody ever wonders why the hell is cousin Shane responding to me, but uh, can't get Mike to give me the time of day. Well, now you can. So I'm here. I'll be sporting the show. It's going to get better and ever. And doing this video work is going to take up a lot more of my time. So, hey, we're all in. And, you know, this is the best time ever. If you want the podcast to keep going, you know, buy the merchandise. That really helps us out. Give us the reviews. Subscribe on YouTube, and we're going to have sponsors, uh, you know, official sponsors this season. We're going to have some fantasy sports, stuff like that. So partaking in all of that is going to how you're going to – that's going to keep this show going. So we're really going to rely on you guys to to keep this momentum going. And, uh, you know, this the, the podcast does better and better each year, and we just think that going this route is just going to make it grow that much more. So, hey, we're, we're investing in the show, and we hope that uh, each and every one of you – kind of gets fully invested with us yeah and it seems like only yesterday i was uh doing this live from a telephone under the gazebo you remember <laughs> <laughs> between the trains <laughs> oh man we've come a long way and and you know this is something i mean i don't know if we really expect it to, expected it to get this big this quick uh but it has grown a lot and a lot of that has to do with you guys um, and, and we appreciate it. You know, I see some of these guys retweeting the show and, mm-hmm. and, and things like that on Twitter. And I noticed them from three years ago doing the same thing, right. you know? So there was a lot of guys and girls out there that, that were with us in the beginning. And there's some new fans out there right now. Uh, I just, I, I just want to let you know that this is a, this is going to be a monumental year for, for that SEC podcast. And, uh, not only have are we going to try to do better with uh, the material that we're bringing to you? Uh, but, you know, we just want to make it an overall better and more enjoyable product. And and we're hoping, honestly, man, by the time this season wraps up that, that you know, who knows, maybe we both can just do this full time. And uh, I'd like to travel around, you know, something we've always talked about doing is hitting some of these uh, universities you know, kind of doing something with the games and, and things like that. So, you know, we, we wouldn't do any of that if it weren't for you guys. So, again, we appreciate the support. Mike, you look fantastic. Uh, you know, that, that it definitely didn't add 10 pounds, man. You must have been working out. <laughs> More like 50. But, uh, hey, hey, we'll get there as the show grows. Maybe we may have to lose some weight while, the, while we're doing it. You know what? That's the real two weeks, man. I, I'm crash dieting. <laughs> Get ready for this thing. (laughs) 
Oh, man. No, I'm excited, man. And, uh, and of course, we got some football content to come to you today, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, hey, one other thing I wanted to mention, oh. of course, uh, we've got a website now, thatseccpodcast.com. Find uh, anything on the show there. I'm going to be writing there as well. And, again, no advertisements on that, just like the YouTube. Uh, we're doing this from the ground up. We're just trying to gain our audience. So check us on out over at thatseccpodcast.com. We'll have a newsletter coming there, too. So, like I said, the show is going to blow up this football season, and uh, that's where I'm spending 100% of my focus just to, to make it the best product we possibly can. So, But like you said, Shay, hey, we got a lot. Uh -huh. One second, Mike. On the web, I got to tell you, man, this website is fantastic, and it's going to continue to get better. But, yeah, I I don't know about you guys, but there's always been that time you needed a schedule or you needed a roster mm -hmm. or you needed some sort of information to collect and you didn't have anywhere to go. So this makes it easy, you know, because a lot of times you click on those websites and next thing you know, you're watching 15 videos or it's like <laughs> 30 slides and you're like, that's not what we wanted. We just wanted the instant information. That's what this, this website will offer. And I'm telling you, it's going to be fantastic. You're going to be able to find your podcast there. You're going to find all kinds of content. So uh, I'm looking forward to that too, man. I, I have nothing to do with it. Clearly, Cousin Shane had no <laughs> part of, of getting this website up and running. I still don't know how that works. <laughs> we got to start with a tribute here. Bobby Bowden, legendary Florida State coach. I'm the biggest SEC homer there is, Shane, but uh, yeah. even I think you'll remember that you know, it was Bobby Bowden and his Florida State teams that got mm -hmm. even me into flo into college football. Just, yeah, I loved watching those teams. I uh, loved the uniforms, and of course, loved uh, Bobby Bowden and everything. Yeah. He really seemed to do it the right way. Never heard a bad word said about the guy, and he tragically passed away this weekend. And uh, uh, we've got some really good comments here from Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher, who they share some uh, kind of behind the scenes that uh, gives you an indication of just what a great man Bobby Bowden was. You know, a couple things I'd like to mention is, um, you know, Coach Bobby Bowden's passing is something that uh, really is um, saddens all of college football. Uh, this guy was probably uh, the greatest ambassador, at least in my view, or one of the great ambassadors of all time uh, because he coached, he had success coaching, but he was also one of the greatest people uh, and set a, an outstanding example for everyone in our profession in terms of uh, you don't have to dislike somebody, you don't have to discredit somebody that you're competing against, that um, you, you, your, your example of being a uh, good person uh, is, you know, something that can help us all professionally. Uh, he wasn't always just about him. Uh, he was always about helping other people. And our thoughts and prayers go out to his family um, and friends, uh, th th this, this is a uh, very sad time for all of us, but, you know, Coach Bowden leaves a legacy that uh, a lot of us can continue to learn from and grow from and uh, something that will never be forgotten. So, um, Coach, um, Coach Bowden is a big staple, especially here in Alabama. What was something that you remember of those Florida State teams and what was your relationship with him one-on-one uh, -on -one? and did you kind of pick his brain throughout the years as a coach? Um, well, you know, first of all, I think everybody knows this story, but I think it's still worth, you know, telling because there's not very many people in the world that um, would have that kind of compassion for somebody else. When Coach Bowden was a, an assistant coach at West Virginia University, and I think Jim Carlin was the head coach, uh, he kind of recruited the area that I grew up in in West Virginia, which was pretty rural. and. You know, I think we had three players from my era that played at West Virginia University that were really good players and all ended up making All-American uh, that Coach Bowden recruited that my dad actually coached in Pop Warner. Um, so they knew each other much better than I knew Coach Bowden as a high school player growing up. But um, my first year of being a graduate assistant when my father passed away and I was at Kent State being a graduate assistant for Don James. And, um, you know, one day the phone rings and it's Coach Bowden and, you know, he says, I know your father passed away. I know your mom might be struggling if you feel like you need to come closer to home because Morgantown was like 25 miles from where I grew up. Um, I'll ha I'll, I have a job for you here if you need to do that. So I was like, wow, this guy's the head coach at West Virginia University and, 
He has that much compassion for my family and our situation and our circumstance and my mother. Um, I, not very many people would, would do something like that. So, but I think that was a reflection of what kind of person he was. Uh, I've always tried to emulate Coach Bowden in terms of the class that he represented his organization with. I uh, seldom said a bad word about anybody. I uh, was always very kind and upbeat uh, to everybody that he ever met uh, and was always that way with me. Uh, and I would talk to him on occasion about, um, you know, things that, you know, I had questioned about professionally. and. There's probably not many in this profession that I have more respect for than Coach Bowden, not only as a coach, not only what he sort of accomplished on the field, but uh, the kind of person he was, the kind of character he had, and uh, the class that um, he sort of exemplified as a college football coach. Let's okay. start off today with uh, to keep the Bowden family in your prayers. I know we, we lost a great man in Coach Bobby Bowden today and uh, meant so many things to so many people, meant a ton to me. And not only just when I coached with him, but when I was learning to be a coach and around him and at different times with his family and what kind of person he was and who he was. It's amazing how he affected so many people, but he lived his life the way it was. And like I said, it's fine a gentleman and coach that's ever walked the sideline, um, in my opinion. And uh, just a uh, tremendous human being. But the lives he touched and the players he touched, uh, that's his legacy. And that's what he always talked about. And we did in the last times we talked about that. He, he said those things. and. Uh, he definitely did that, so he lived a fulfilled life and uh, said he was ready. And he knows where he's definitely at, that's for sure. I'm, I'm sure you have a bunch, but I wondered if you could share maybe a couple of your favorite uh, memories or stories about Coach Bowden. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, you know, there's so many. It, it, it just my favorite ones I tell. Can't tell them all. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm trying to think my favorite one. My favorite one of me was when I, I always think of this, when I was learning to be a coach and used to work the Bowden Academies, the, the amount of information that used to come out of him that he didn't even realize he was exerting and how he did things. Not when I coached with him, not even when I was there. We do the Bowden Academy, which was the thing, they have that Manning Academy now. Well, that was all bridged and thought of after the Bowden Academy. That's what started all that and gave all the ideas. Matter of fact, Peyton was in the camp. He used to come, he came to the camp and things. And it was quarterbacks and receivers all over the country that came from everywhere. And that's all you did for three days was throw the football and run routes and catch the football. And uh, we used to sit there. My, 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 some of my greatest memories was sitting there with him afterwards, like after the camp was over, because I was a counselor for the quarterbacks. And Tommy and Jeff did receivers. Terry did quarterbacks. We were all there, and Bobby drove around, looked at everybody, you know, and watched everybody, and kept everything. Was there at every camp, every second of every moment on the field because it was a family affair, and I was included in that and was very blessed to be in that. But at night, when all the coaches would come and people would bring people, and some old coaches and his old buddies, sometimes it knew him from years ago, played for him, different things. They'd stay, get a dorm room, and you'd set up in the dorm up at even at Sanford. You'd sit there in the dorms, put your feet up, and he'd take his socks off, put his feet up on the table, just like a. I mean, he was so normal. He, he's. He could make you feel like you knew him for 20 years in the first two minutes you ever talked to him. He was so genuine and honest. And just sitting there telling stories about ball, and coach would ask him questions and things he would do and how he handled recruiting situations and how he handled And I, as a young guy, you know, just uh, 22, 23 years old, sat there and would just listen over and over and over and over and over. And then if he was outside by the pool, sometimes we'd – then we had it at different places eventually, and sometimes there was a pool there. If we were staying in a little dorm, he'd have his feet out there and he always sat out there. Mm -hmm. We'd always sit, and he and I had a bad habit. We both chewed. And people didn't know that about it. We both chewed. We'd sit there and have to chew and spit, and everybody else would watch. But, I mean, and, but he would talk to everybody. But just the knowledge he would put out and how he did things, the way he did things, stories about people back then. And back when he was learning to coach, how he admired Coach Bryant, how he admired the different people he grew up admiring in, in, the, in the day, and just listening to him, the volume of information you used to get. That was my favorite memories of him. It really was. Now, when I coached with him, it was phenomenal, and we had some unbelievable talks. So he was – an unbelievable historian of the game and loved the game. And our memories of Sanford together because we both played there. Uh, and then how it was Howard College then, and he went back. And people know because people forget he was, you know, he went to Alabama on scholarship. And he left Alabama after a semester. And, you know, the people didn't know the reason why is because he went back and married Ann. You couldn't be on scholarship at that time and be married, believe that or not. 
when they first got married, and it was more important. He wanted to marry Annie, moved back, and he went to Sanford, and how he did it, how he gave that up. And I ended up transferring to Sanford. It was just ironic. I mean, we we talk about different things, why you make decisions in life and coaching and, and just listening to him. It was just a, mat, a volume of knowledge and what he did and how he did it. And then, you know, some of the times that, like, they have – I remember when I first became an offensive coordinator at Sanford, and that was in uh, going into the 91 season. After the 90 year, Jeff, had, Jeff was the OC. I was quarterback coach, and Jeff went to take the job at Southern Miss. So Terry made me the OC and wanted to learn. So that year they were playing Penn State. I'll never forget him and Joe Paterno were playing in the uh, Blockbuster Bowl. Blockbuster Bowl back then was really good. They were both top 10 teams. They were great. As a matter of fact, it was Dossie's senior year. And uh, so I went, and I became a coordinator. And I sat, and the family took me, put me in the hotel, kept me up. I mean, I stayed there the whole week with them and went to every meeting he did. And I sat in the back of his, his coaching meetings, just watched him organize and structure. Then I did his offensive meetings and watched him set up his offense, how he called it, what he did when he watched film, was just a fly on the wall sitting in the back. And then I remember sitting, and then I went to the press box that night in the game and put the headsets on without a phone and listened to him call the game. He and Joe Paterno were going at it that night, back and forth, back and forth. And Dossie that year was a first-team All-American. And I remember this game was getting – I always remember this. He always saw that players make a difference in, in games, not plays. You got to make sure you got to certain guys, have that certain list of guys that you have to get that ball to. And Amp Lee was the MVP that night. He played good. Casey Weldon was good. But Dossie was a star, and they had to have plays. And I remember they had a little list of plays over here heading to the ball. And he kept saying, Mark, Mark. He's talking to Mark Rick, who was his quarterback coach at the time. Uh, Brad Scott, I believe, was the offense coordinator. And uh, we got to get that ball to Dossie. We got to get that ball. And he had to pull those plays out, man. About five or six, about running about six plays, and about four or five of them went straight to Dossie. And they caught it, went straight down the field, won a big game. And just those experiences, how much, how vital that was to me at such a young age to learn how to organize, how to structure, how to treat people, but then more importantly, and then how to coach and then, you know, and call games and do things. And his style was different than a lot of different guys sometimes on offense and how he did it. And, just, I mean, just I could go on. I could sit and tell hours of those stories. I mean, hours of them. Some things he'd occasionally hit me on the sideline when I was calling plays in the game. Come up there and, I mean, he made some, it was just some of the little comments he'd make every now and then. come out of him, huh? And no idea. But then you knew it, it was coming out of who it was coming out of. It was, it was such unbelievable respect and how he would say things. Funny time, he'd say some funny things to you during the game one time. You'd be in the middle of calling plays. Maybe he, one time he bumped me and said something to me. I ain't going to say what he said. It was a good thing. It was about we were moving the ball up and down the field and, and, uh, I, I started laughing, almost got delayed game because he just caught me completely off guard when he would say those things. But he was, but he was just a tremendous man, tremendous competitor, and like I said, the lives he affected and the people he affected he didn't even know about is, is the amazing thing about him. So. All right, Shane. So there you got it from uh, Nick Saban and mm. Jimbo Fisher, and I mean those are two of the the giants in the game today. And you know when they're singing the praises of uh, Bobby Bowden like this, you just know uh, you know. Who knows countless lives he touched during his coaching career. You know what? Well, th that's the thing, man. Coaches, players, fans, uh, even like you said, there was a time when Mike was, uh, was an FSU fan, you know, I, now that was, a that was, a growing years. You know, it's like, when you look back at those photos, you're like, I can't believe I wore that hair. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I had Jinko jeans there for a week, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, it was hard not to to enjoy some of the teams that he put out, some of the players. And, and I'm a huge NFL fan as well, as you know, and there's a lot of Florida State fans that wound up uh, on my Pittsburgh Steelers team. So I, I, I love listening to coaches. I wish I, you know, there, I know there was a lot that, uh, that Jimbo wanted to say, but he just kept <laughs> holding it back because, you know, Bobby was one of those guys that he, he was just a magnet. Uh, you would see him talking in groups and everybody was always huddled around him mm -hmm. because he just kind of had that personality. He reminds you of that guy you see at Hardy's, you know, <laughs> in the morning <laughs> eating breakfast and everybody's listening to his stories. That was Bobby Bowden. And uh, he had stories. He was just, he was someone you wanted to be around. I wish I could have met him, but you look at, I, I, I was looking at earlier today, man, I don't want to get off, off track too much here, but you know, his coaching tree, Mm -hmm. And and you you look at this coaching tree and you see names like Jimbo Fisher, Will Muschamp, Dabo Sweeney, you know Daryl Dickey, Kirby Smart, you know some of these big names that you know may not be where they're at right now if it wasn't for for Bobby Bowden. So I, I just 
it's just he was one of those coaches to me, Mike. And I and I hate I'll shut up here a second. When I think about because I love the 90s, obviously as a Tennessee ball fan, you love the 90s. And and you thought about some of the winning as coaches at that time. And it was it was Joe Pa, it was Bobby Bowden, it was Philip Fulmer, you know, it was these big I just Spurrier. Spurrier. He's just winning as coaches that you just you, they just they're bigger than life and and it's amazing the fallout after they left the amount of coaches the the way that football changed because of the way their minds work yeah without a doubt and it just you know it takes you back to the glory days in, in our opinion you know i mean of, of college football not that it's hell we love it to death now but uh <laughs> just you know growing up with it with these guys it just kind of I don't know. It just takes you back to, to some of those fond memories, doesn't it? Absolutely, man. Well, I'll tell you one real quick, Mike. 1998, uh, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> there was a big year. But if you if you don't know, Florida State lost early that season to, to I think it was like North Carolina State or something like that. Mm-hmm. So they were out of the race because Kansas State, you know, another great coach, Bill Snyder, mm-hmm. uh, was, was killing it and was undefeated. And then – and I was happy because here we are undefeated. I was like, hell yeah, let's play Kansas State, you know. <laughs> Lawrence State, ain't Florida State. And then they drop the Big 12 championship to uh, Texas A&M of all teams. Yep. And all of a sudden, Florida State pops back up. And, and you should have just felt it. There was a lot of emotion when that happened because there was a lot of Tennessee fans that did not want to play Florida state. They were pumped up about Kansas state here. They came up and uh, you remember Peter Wark, not, not Pe- oh, yeah, yeah. Peter Wark. That was like the most dangerous player at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but needless to say, I, I won't, I won't go too far, but I was one of those that was worried about Florida state and, and was happy. We were able to secure that victory, but you know, what do they do next year? They go out, they get the perfect season. So one of my favorite tweets that came out today was from uh, Darren Ravel. Mm-hmm. And it says in January 1976, Bobby Bowden left West Virginia for Florida State thanks to receiving a raise. He made $35,000 a year with the Mountaineers, contracted Florida State, $37,500 is what it costs. So uh, I just, I thought that was a fun tweet. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, hey man, we're loaded. We got camps all over the SEC. So really for the first time since the end of last year, you ready to go around the league? Let's do it. Now let's go now around, let's the go around the league. Uh, my my daughters said something about me wearing a visor and need to put on a hat because I'm getting bald. So uh, I'm going to wear a hat from here on out. I mean, if you look over the next six years, I think we played Miami three times, Florida State six times, South Florida three times, Mississippi State once. So who's the SEC teams? You know, I mean, I don't think I think it's an injustice for the kids. They should, we should mix those games up, and you should, um, you know, play more teams from the West. Why, why don't you start calling around and see if you can get somebody else to play us, and we'll play them. I, we'll play anybody you can get to play us. In Louisiana, hold on a second. Hey guys, hey, I'm having a press conference, okay? Thank you. All right, Shay. Well, hey, it's been a while since I had you on the show, and uh, we had a great clip here from Tennessee assistant coach Mike Eckler. And this is a quick one, but I just had to play it. We love to start with something fun if we can. And Mike Eckler, special teams coach, outside linebackers coach, what does he look for in a kick returner? What does he look for in a punt returner? Let's kick it on over to Mike Eckler. All right, kickoff return. You don't have to be a real make you miss type guy, but you got to be a guy who can run through the doggone smoke. You know, you ever you remember um, tell, or not um, Days of Thunder? You remember when he dropped the hammer and went through the smoke? That's what the video I show him. I mean, that's what kickoff that's what kickoff returns like. I mean, you got bodies everywhere, man, and you got if you're scared, you better call 911. You you got to run through the damn smoke. Punt returner. Now you look like a, you look for a fart in a skillet. You look for a guy, a fart in a skillet, a guy who can make you miss, you know, a guy one cut, get vertical, you know, that, that elusive guy. So it's a little bit different. And, you know, punt return, it's not like kickoff. You don't have everybody coming down full bore. I mean, you got windows and you got space and you have levels. So you can be a little more, 
you can be a, more, a little more of a, a guy who's going to going to make some cuts from inside out. All right, Shade, as country as you are, have you ever used the phrase fart in a skillet? No, this is one of those metaphors I think you just made up on the spot, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one uh this one I've never heard of. So maybe it's maybe I'm the wrong part of the woods, but uh growing up in Tennessee here, I've never heard that. <laughs> All right, uh, next, let's kick it on down to Tuscaloosa. Roll Tide! Uh, Alabama kicking off their training camp here, of course. And, uh, man, this guy just cannot stay healthy. I feel terrible for him. For the defensive lineman, LeBrian Ray, he's been, ba- he's been banged up for th- about three years now. So, yeah. uh, Saban, we'll get to his comments here in a moment, but uh, revealed he had a – Ray's got a groin injury. He's going to hold him out for the next couple weeks. But it's not all bad news because Trey Sanders and Malachi Moore, they should be uh, good to go here entering training camp. So I don't know what – I think the biggest topic for me and I think just about everybody when you're talking Alabama heading into training camp has got to be the fact that, uh, you know, new offensive coordinator Bill O'Brien and new quarterback and so many yeah. new options on that offensive side of the ball and how quickly do those guys mesh because – you know, we all know Alabama, they're going to smoke the hell out of Miami in the opener, but yeah, it's not long before week three, they're at Florida. They got Ole Miss. They got Texas A&M. That's all in the, in the first half of the schedule here. So, you know, we're used to seeing Alabama score 50 points a game, but uh, mm-hmm. I think it'd be unrealistic for them to expect to hit that clip right out the gate, but uh, they're going to, they may have to, they may have to get pretty close to that by the time they get to that meat of the schedule. What do you think about that? Mm. Mike, I expect a 50 point game week one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think, I don't think you tra- change the stripes of this tiger. You know, I, right. I think these guys come out and, and they're firing off on all cylinders because you got, you got some players on that team that, that are thinking about last year, you know, and they don't want that hanging over them. They mm-hmm. want it. This needs, this the season's about them. You got a Bill O'Brien that wants to open up an offense, you know, he's coming off a, a terrible, a terrible season in the NFL. You know, he wants to make a good name for himself. So I expect a high potent offense again this year from Alabama. And I think we see it week one. Okay. Well, Hey, I think Saban's right there with you because he was asked, of course, uh, you know, what, what's it like having all these former head coaches coming in and out of your program? Of course, he's no stranger to having that done, but now it's just, Bill O'Brien and, and Doug Marone from the NFL ranks. So it's kind of an interesting uh, talking point heading into camp and on how Bill O'Brien is, uh, based on what he's seen so far, really effective teacher of the game. Uh, from an injury standpoint, um, the only, I, I think LeBrian Ray uh, has a pretty significant growing injury that he kind of got toward the end of the summer uh, that may keep him out for a couple of weeks. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get him back and uh, he'll be confident in his ability to play. And we'll just have to wait and see day to day how that goes. What What's the key to making it work when you're hiring former head coaches or who are kind of used to doing things their own way, being being the boss? Well, I, I think that we, you know, one of the first sort of steps in us being a team uh, is that everybody has to buy into the principles and values of the team. And the level of commitment and the standard that we want to try to achieve. And so everybody has to buy in and make a commitment to those things. And when I said, you know, earlier, coaches and players alike, now that's exactly what I mean. And, you know, so far, that's not been a problem. Uh, Those coaches have worked out very, very well. They've worked hard to try to do things the way uh, we do them at Bama. And um, I, I think I wouldn't think that any players you know, really recognize anything different from at least a, a mindset of how we try to do things, how we want to do things, um, how we try to hold people accountable to do things the right way, uh, and how they've tried to work hard to implement that. Hey, Coach, uh, just want to ask you about Bill O'Brien. Now that you've seen him in practice and in meetings, just what have your impressions been of him up to this point? Yeah, I think Bill's done a really good job. Uh, first off, he's a good teacher. Um, and you know, I think when you're a good coach, you're a good coach all the time, uh, whether we're in camp with, you know, seventh and eighth grade kids, you know, playing quarterback or defensive back or whatever it is, you know, you're trying to coach those guys to be better, just like you would our own players. And, 
Uh, I see that in everything that he's done uh, since he's been here. Uh, I think the players have responded well uh, to the coaches on offense. And, um, you know, so I think there's nothing but positives. Now, we haven't been through a game yet together, and I think all these things are sort of a, a work in progress as you go, uh, as they find out what your expectation is and then how they respond to it. But so far, they've responded in a positive way to each and everything we've asked them to do. You know, not a ton to, to come out of Nick Saban here from uh, just the intro of the presser here, but I really thought these uh, comments on Bill O'Brien kind of stood out to me because, again, I know you're high on him, but – uh, he, that's kind of the, and I say question mark, but remember last year, what was the, we had on uh Clint lamb and, and we asked him about, uh, you know, what's the weakest point of Alabama? And he's like, well, the punter, you know, like yeah. to me, it's, this is almost <laughs> the same. It's a continuation of that because we may be sitting here saying, well, is this guy that uh, has been a head coach at Penn state and Houston Texans? And uh, he's been working with Bill Belichick how qualified is he to run Alabama offense? But he's going to have more talent than anybody he faces with. So it's a good <laughs> it's a good problem to have. But uh, maybe I'm just seeing a little tiny, you know, I'm, I, there's a little crack in the dam, and I'm trying to make it a, a huge huge geyser here for the rest of the SEC. Maybe I'm, I'm reading too much into it. Yeah, I think you are, Mike. And, and let me tell you why. Because <laughs> when I as, again back to the NFL, Bill O'Brien, as watching him there at Houston. Mm -hmm. You know, there for a little bit, he got away from calling the plays. And I think that was part of the problem with uh, with the Texans. But I think the biggest problem was just the management of the team. You know, just uh, the some of the players that he did keep, some of the players that he went after, just the money. And the nice thing, the beautiful thing about Alabama is he doesn't have to worry about it. The roster's there. All he has to do is put those guys in the right place, keep the offense a humming, and that's something that he is good at doing. And, and my biggest thing with him is it's not like he's going against multiple Alabama teams. He, you know, there's going to be a couple of teams on the schedule that have as much talent as Alabama, but he's always gonna he's always gonna have the upper hand pretty much. And I, I just think, given Bill a. a a t I don't know a, a clean slate and mm -hmm. a fresh roster of NFL talent. I think I think they thrive, man. You know, one of the teams that projects to be their toughest competition. Let's jump it on down to College Station, where Jimbo Fisher met with the media for the first time going into training camp, and yeah, you know, I really liked a lot of what he had to say on uh, you know just the the leadership and the competition there in that locker room and so many players on that defensive side of the ball that could potentially be in the NFL right now. But they came back to, uh, you know, not only improve their stock, but to, you know, get A&M where they want to be. Uh, what were your thoughts on uh, his comments there just on the defense? Well, I'm confused because he mentioned something in there about national championship. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, see, that's what I was going to get to next with the quarterback. Yeah. And this this, you know, I understand what Jimbo's trying to say. It threw me off a little bit when he started talking about national championship. I was like. Wait, is he talking about Florida State still, or, or are we talking about <laughs> Texas A&M? I, I think the the biggest thing when I look at some of these these coaches across the SEC, you know, it was a tough gig last year, you know, just winning, just playing in, in general and getting through week to week. But at the tail end of the season, convincing a lot of these kids to come back was very hard to do. And there was a few programs that really excelled at it. You think of Arkansas, you think of uh, Texas A&M. Um, there was a few that went to the NFL clearly, you mm -hmm. know, because they got a ton of talent. But there was a lot coming back. And I think that says a lot about the locker room and what these kids want to accomplish. They know that they were one game away from being contenders. And th I'm sure there was a lot of sleepless nights, and they wish they could have it back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Let's kick it over to Jimbo Fisher because uh, one comment here in particular when he did reference the national championship, I thought uh, that was the highlight of what he had to say, and uh, I'll touch on that on the other side. Uh, how were y'all able to convince so many uh, bonus seniors, whatever you want to call them, super seniors, to return to this defense that was already pretty good last year? Well, I think they also saw the value in coming back for the team and what they accomplished, and I think a lot of guys – accomplished so much in what it felt like to win a championship or almost win a national championship and, and like that feeling. And, and then I think also the benefit of them at their next level, it, it's a two, you know, it's a double-edged sword that 
we have a great team. You were great players with it. They enjoyed that success in which we had and how we had it and the way we had it. And uh, to get there, but then also their personal development to be able to play at the next level. I think it will enhance every one of those guys' ability to make the NFL and play in the NFL and be a, and be a very significant draft pick and factor in it. And I think it's, you know, it's a combination of both. And I think both guys, and they loved A&M. What's impressed you the most these first two days of camp? Well, I, I don't know if anything's impressed me, but hopefully the urgency to be good. And, and we've done some really good things. And some of the veteran guys are acting like veterans. And the young guys, I think, are anxious to compete. I think the competition level and guys wanting to push each other for jobs is one of the main things that's that's starting to push. And I, hopefully that depth, will, that, that pushes that out there, the young talent with the older talent and those guys challenging for positions and playing time. And I think that's uh, probably been the, the best thing so far. I know it's only been two days, Coach, but what are the early impressions of Haynes and Zach battling out for that QB1 They had good, solid days. I, you know, one of them, I, I, I if we're ones and three, we, we split them up one day. One had the ones, the other day the other one had the ones. So they've been, you know, two days, have done a good job. They have good knowledge. You can see they worked hard in the summer. So, you know, it's been two days in, so we'll watch that. This is, like I say, this is an early day for Van Dan Media Day, so it hadn't been a ton of practice. But I've been, I've been happy with both practices. And there's been some little mistakes here and there that we'll clean that we'll continue to clean up, just like they always do. But, you know, I've been pleased. Kellen being here for the last few mm -hmm. years, that's a luxury to have experience at mm -hmm. that position. Uh, now that you're going to have a new guy starting, uh, how much enthusiasm are you seeing on that defensive side? Because they know they're going to have to really step up while these guys figure out how to Well, I think offense. everybody knows how they play. Whether who's the court when Kellen was or there. I mean, you say that, but then you, put, you don't put limitations on a new guy. I did that one year and won a national championship with a redshirt freshman. I said that coming in. So, I mean, you know, you don't know how. I don't want to put limitations on him, or I don't want to put limitations on a redshirt sophomore and Zach Calzada. I mean, both guys haven't played as much, but both guys are very talented. So, you know, either way with Zach or Haynes, you know, either way. But I think the defense does understand the experience they have and what they have and the abilities they have. And I think this – I don't think it's anything they do that they have to do anything different. They have to do their job and they have to do it well and they have to – as they mature into who they are and they get better at their craft of becoming – wanting to become a dominant – group of guys, no matter if you're off or whoever that is. And I think our defense has that mentality, and I think they can have that mentality and have that ability. So this is the perfect thing, Shay, because it's it's like, you know, we've been seeing all off season the expectations. You know, it's so cheesy when they say, well, the expectations are – they're never higher but in the locker room. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen that from the Aggies this off season, And, yeah. hell, you're seeing it right here. How many coaches – we don't – we all know that, uh, you know, Alabama, Nick Saban, their goal is to win the national championship every year. But not even he comes out first first presser and says, you know, <laughs> we've got the pieces here to win the national championship. We've got Jimbo uh, this offseason talking about how he's going to kick Nick Saban's ass and all this. So, I mean, they are riding a, a huge wave of confidence. And I really loved his comments here. You know, whether it's Hayes King, whether it's Zach Calzada, they are not going to be – going into the uh, the season in neutral on offense. They're going full full slate ahead because uh, they've got all the pieces around whoever the quarterback is to be very dangerous. And this probably going to be the best defense of the Jimbo Fisher era. So uh, a lot of pieces in place. And I, I just love the confidence uh, from Jimbo Fisher. Yeah. And I never understood that, the, the locker room thing. You know, it's like – because I think about when I was in the locker room, we were discussing if we're going to Fazoli's or not at half. You know? <laughs> it's like, we're already down 21 points. They got a Fazoli's over here. You want to do that after the game? <laughs> but uh, I, I joke, man. One thing about Texas A&M is it's a perfect blend of young talent and old talent. And that old talent coming back and, and – I think galvanizing that locker room, you know, these guys are on a mission. And if there's anybody to upset Alabama in the West, you know, I, I'm thinking of two teams right now, LSU mm -hmm. and Texas A&M. It's going to have to be one of those guys. And I'm not saying that Ole Miss doesn't pop up or Mississippi State doesn't surprise a few teams. But right now in August, I, I have full – I have full – What's the word I'm looking for, Mike? Confidence. I have, yeah, man. I mean, look at that roster; it's freaking loaded. And if not now, kind of like what we're talking about with Georgia. If not now, then when, Jimbo? So I like the confidence my head ball coach coming out here. Uh, you know, he's the nail, and mm -hmm. all these kids are following him. So that's what I like to hear. 
Well, speaking of expectations, let's jump on down to Athens. Kirby Spartan crew, they've opened camp, and we all know the expectation down there. And, hell, even Dan Mullen poking fun at the fact that uh, nobody's going to be picking the Gators this offseason. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter for anything, of course, once they hit the field. But uh, we all know the pieces that Georgia has in place. They finally have the quarterback with uh, JT Daniels there. And just when it looked like maybe they lost a huge piece with uh, George Pickens going down, then they pick up a guy like an Arik Gilbert. So yeah. they didn't need to reload, but they've reloaded on top of not needing to reload. So it's like, <laughs> my goodness. And uh, I keep saying it to everybody that'll listen that uh, – with all due respect to uh, Zeus and James Cook, who I think are outstanding running backs, I think Kendall Milton, the third stringer, is going to be, by the end of the year, the best running back on that roster. But that just goes to show you how deep the Bulldogs are. You know, I, I get in a sense of that from Kirby that, that they're very confident heading into the season, don't you think? Oh, God, yeah. But that's, again, just like Jimbo, this is what you want to hear from your coach. This is what you want to hear from your players. It's mm -hmm. a united front. This is the season, Mike. I mean, I, I know they're sick and tired of the 1980 jokes. <laughs> yeah, right. let's 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 bring in the new year. This is the East. You got it right now. The only other team that's going to compete is the Florida Gators. So, mm -hmm. does, if if I don't know, man, I I'm tired of making excuses for them because that's what it felt like I've done the last two years, and I and I kept telling everybody this is the year, this is the year, and and I keep getting, you know. I mean, I get a lot of flack for it, but I really do think that this is the season. You've got the quarterbacks, you got the running backs, you got the wide receivers, you got the defense, you got plenty of age on that roster, you got leaders on that roster. I mean, come on, the schedule, the path is clear, Bulldogs. If it's not now, then when? Mm -hmm. Well, let's kick it over to Kirby Talks, uh, JT Daniels, Arik Gilbert. And then uh, one interesting comment, though, here for the receivers. This, this is the one I really wanted to ask you about. Kirby, I wanted to ask about JT's confidence. Uh, you've seen him now for a year plus. And uh, can you talk about his evolution as it relates to that while he was watching versus when he's now playing and, and the expected starter? Yeah, I, I, I've really not seen a lot of difference in his confidence. He, he is, uh, I think, to play the quarterback position, you have to be a confident person uh, in and of itself. Uh, he's probably got more um, – Confidence for good reason from actually experience in the SEC having played than he had prior, but uh, he didn't lack confidence, you know, whether it was in his arm, his mind, uh, any of that when he first got here. If anything, he probably lacked some confidence in his knee and trusting that, but um, confidence has not been something that that, uh, that he lacks in. I think his, his mental growth and maybe his confidence in his relationship with receivers um, and tight ends has improved. Um, his relationships with the players, just sheer connection has improved, which therefore has improved confidence. He feels much more confident that he can demand excellence when he knows somebody personally than walking out there and, you know, you've been on Zoom with a team for three months, you know, this time last year, and you didn't have that relationship. So he's in a much better uh, position to be confident. Kirby, uh, when a couple years ago, you know, you were asked about um, Alabama and their offensive evolution. You were think you were asked the same thing about LSU, and you pointed to the fact that they built their offenses around their strengths, which was wide receiver play and, and having explosive wideouts. Do you feel like you have the type of group there at, at your pass catching positions, at your wide receiver positions, for you guys to kind of make that same evolution? Well, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but I think Alabama had four first rounders. Okay, now I know they had them in separate years. I don't, I don't know that we have four first rounders uh, at wide out. If that's what you're asking, I know LSU had two uh, first round receivers on the D, on the team we played. Um, maybe it wasn't two, maybe it was one. I'm not sure where Jefferson went, but um, I do know that they had a first round back, a first round receiver, and the first overall quarterback. So I don't, I don't know how ours compare to that because you can only know that after the fact. Uh, you can't compare it to before the fact, but I do know that having skill players that can light up the scoreboard and score points is certainly critical. Um, I think that we've been able to close the gap in terms of if the standard was uh, uh, Alabama or LSU in terms of those offenses, we've probably closed that gap. But I don't know that we have four first rounders. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we have that. Arik Gilbert make you guys more dynamic on offense, and how do you go about getting him up to speed with him coming in over the summer so he can contribute as quickly as he can? I think learning's the key. I mean, he's got to learn the system. He's got to understand uh, 
uh, what we're trying to do offensively. Words, you know, I mean, we don't have a lot of different plays than, than you know, the other place he was, but it may be called something different. So I would almost say vocabulary and uh, uh, learning, you know, how we practice and, and, and how to learn our stuff at a fast rate. That's the key for him. All right, Shane, I don't know about you, but uh, it kind of seemed to me like Kirby Smart was basically challenging his receivers, saying, do we got two, three, four first-round picks uh, in our receiver room? I don't know that we do. But, uh, it, was, it was interesting because that's kind of what everybody looks at when you look at Alabama last season, LSU two seasons ago. We all you know, praise the quarterbacks, and, and they deserve it. They had a hell of seasons there at Joe Burrow and Mac Jones, but – it all starts and ends with that. Uh, we're just having so many weapons that uh, defenses cannot stop. Do you think Georgia will be able to, uh, you know, have a, a unit that resembles kind of what we've seen from from Alabama and LSU in recent years? Wow, Mike. Let's. I mean, let's let's slow down here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting excited, but uh, uh, I mean, you're 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 talking about some of the all time greatest wide receivers I've ever seen in college football yeah. play. I mean, mm -hmm. so does Georgia have that? Maybe, but I, I'm not ready to, to crown them by no means. And, and that's one thing that you, you see this with, with coaches that've got a loaded roster, you know, they've they got to find little ways to fire up those, those, those monsters. Mm -hmm. And this is how you do it because they're, they're the kids look at press clippings. They're, they're the ones that are hitting all these little links out here and, and learning things. So uh, absolutely, I, I, I would 100% believe that this is just to fire those kids up. All right, next, Shane, hey, we talked about uh, the, the threat that LSU could be in the West this year. Hell, I, that's my pick to win it. Let's jump on down to Baton Rouge. Go Tigers. The Tigers open up camp. And, uh, you know, of course, since we've last recorded, we, you know, we noted that uh, Miles Brennan out for – well, not out for the season. I almost misspoke there. But he's going to be out for a little while, and that clears the way for Max Johnson to be the starting quarterback for the Tigers. There's not going to be that camp competition that we thought we were going to be getting. But, you know, it's interesting that uh, now Max Johnson is going to get all the reps, and in a roundabout way, if he was going to be the starter anyway, which I was predicting he would be, does this kind of help LSU to where Max Johnson's getting all the reps, or how do you feel about that? Do you think that uh, you know the competition would have made him better, or do you think it's more about reps? I'm going to tell you right now, Mike. I hate injuries. Um, I, I just I hate it for some of these kids because and and Miles Brennan's a prime example. Lost a starting job last year because of an injury, mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm like you. I don't think he was going to win this job, but if you're an LSU fan. I think part of you is like, you know what? This is not a bad move. This is not a bad deal. Max Johnson is going to get all the ones moving forward. I, I just right. don't see the downside in that. Uh, you know, he's a younger player. But Max Johnson has something that Miles Brennan doesn't. He has that thing that can get them to the next level. Miles Brennan, hell of an arm, but there's a reason that he's lost the job multiple times. He's not the guy. Max mm -hmm. Johnson clearly going to be the winner here in this situation. And I think LSU's better for it. Yeah, and the one thing that I had not even considered that I like the fact that Coach O, we'll get to his comments here in a moment, but the fact that uh, Max Johnson's left-handed and how, you know, <laughs> when you're switching lefty and righty, I mean, I, I don't think it's a huge difference, but I do think there's a difference. You know, yeah, uh, I think your traditional left tackle, at times you flip them over to the right side to protect uh, the blind side and, and so many other things, particularly with a quarterback that can run like Max Johnson with the right. rollouts and the bootlegs and all that thing. So, uh, you know, that that's an interesting comment to make. But I really like the fact that, uh, hell, he's talking talking up uh, Max Johnson, Joe Burrow comparison. So mm -hmm. I think everybody in LSU will like to hear that. And then uh, last thing, man, he kind of – I don't want to say calls out his running backs here, but he says it's time for uh, John Emery and Ty Davis Price to – to live up to that, those, their recruiting billings, so to speak. Uh, you mentioned Max there a second ago. How much it, can it be an advantage now to know you have a month to really work with him, kind of hone things around him? Yeah. What do you all really like about Max, you know, in sort of his skill set that gives you confidence? Yeah. Well, first of all, we miss Miles. It was very unfortunate. And uh, I think Max and Miles and the whole team were looking forward to competition. It was very close. We didn't know who was going to be the starting quarterback. I thought the competition would have been very good for the football team to see that because there's competition at, uh, at every position almost. 
But uh, it does give us that we know who's our starting quarterback. Obviously, he's got to do it, right? and uh, he's got to be able to perform. But it does enable us to do some things. Obviously, he's a lefty and Miles is a righty. It does do us, give us some things that he does different than Miles. Obviously, I'm not going to say everything. I can't. But, you know, we just we know Max is a little bit more mobile than Miles was, and uh, there's some things that he could do. But also, you know, we got to protect him. But you know what? Uh, we got to play to win the game. So whatever that takes, we have to do. What, what do you like about Max? What, the whole pack? Yeah. What do you think? You've talked highly about him for a long yeah. time. Yeah. I see him every day. He's a competitor. He's serious. He reminds me of Joe in a lot of ways, the intangibles, the things that he does, his work ethic. He wants to be number one. He doesn't say much. Uh, there's not a lot of joking around to him. He's uh, always uh, doing well in the classroom, always competing to be first, always competing in the weight room, always studying. Football guy, football family, very competitive. He wants to be great. So I see that from him. He ain't got to tell me about it. Uh, he does have the intangibles. I thought he had a, a very good day today. Uh, he, he's uh, he's tall, he's smart. You can see a lot of things. Uh, I think there's some things that he has to improve on, but he's a young player, and uh, that's more or less uh, things that Jake can work him, work with him. But I do believe he's going to be a championship quarterback. I believe in him. How you doing, Coach? Good, Coach. Um, as far as the running back room is concerned, if no one breaks out, how many guys are you willing to? give a shot to back there will it are you are you a committee guy or would you like to see one guy just win that job you know I do believe that uh, it's time for Tyron and John to do it I'd like to see that it doesn't mean that I don't want to see Armani I don't want to see Josh I want to see Corey I want to give him a chance but those guys in my opinion have to be the lead dogs and for us to get to where we need to go now if another guy beats them out it beats them out you know but I think it's time for those guys to shine I think they're very capable of doing it. I think they're, uh, for the most part, in great shape. I think Kevin's got them in the right mindset. And uh, I'm going to be interested to see how they play this year. How is this not a call out, Mike? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just try I'm trying to give Coach O some credit here. But, yeah, when you're a five-star running back like Emory, you need to uh, you, ne you need to do better than you've done so far. And, you know, this is the missing piece. You know, again, yeah, we all love Joe Burrow. We love all those receivers. They're they're making millions of dollars because they've earned it because they're of that caliber. But cousin Shane, even cousin Shane identified this going into the year. Who was his sleeper pick, SEC Offensive Player of the Year? The, Cl the Clydesdale man. The Clydesdale. So they need that piece to that puts it all together. Absolutely. They need it to be John Emery. They need it to be uh, Ty Davis Price or a combination of 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 those two. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they ain't getting that. There's there there has not there's been a significant drop off at that running back position since uh, Clyde edwards alaire went off to the Kansas City Chiefs and hell I mean he's maybe it's just because he's so damn good I mean he's lighted <laughs> it up uh, since he immediately got there but uh, LSU really needs uh, someone to step up at running back. <laughs> Coach O said he goes I'm not calling you out but <laughs> Ty and John you better get your shit together. <laughs> Because if, I mean, John's one of those guys that you've been waiting on. He's one of those I have. I don't know about you, Mike, but mm -hmm. I've been waiting. Like, this is the year. This is the year. And it's like, where did he go? I don't understand. Is he just good at practice? Is he just good during spring? I don't know. So, yeah, I think John, I, more John than Ty, because they're two different backs. I, I, I think John is the one that we're missing here. That, that like you said, that X factor a dump off guy that johnson can get a hold of and and he can make something out of so i i just they they've been missing that since since ed uh since the lair and why not bring it back and if john can't then let's get some of these one of these younger kids in here and i think that's what coach o is getting to the point like if if he can't get it we're got to move on all right shane let's skip it old dan to fayetteville Woo -pig. sam Pittman met with the media here after uh uh, this is the second time he's actually met with the media since training camp, but the first time since they actually hit the field. And you got to love this. Uh, he's given praise to the quarterbacks. That was something in the spring. He was seemed really upset with uh, their accuracy more than anything. But, you know, they made – you know, this is K.J. Jefferson's job. It's not that there's a, there's a big competition here, but uh, this is what you want coming out with a new starting quarterback, your coach coming out day one saying that's the position group that impressed you the most and 
you know, because that's kind of the big question mark, not in my mind, but a lot of people with Arkansas is if KJ Jefferson, can he get it done? What's the ceiling for this Razorback team? And uh, I think it's, of course, I've been singing his praises all off season. So I know everybody knows I think it's high, but uh, what do you think about how, how high the hogs can climb this year? Yeah. I mean, you set that bar, Mike. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you keep moving it up, moving it up. You're making it tough for these Razorbacks, but I, I, <laughs> I don't know the the thing that that I love most about Arkansas is something I talked about earlier. Th these guys that came back, uh, you know, the fans that have never left. Yeah. This 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 program wants to win so damn bad. You could just tell, and and I think yes, we're going to see some improvement every season, including this year. I just don't know how far. I just don't know how many wins that converts into, mm -hmm. but. But when I'm telling you right now in those games that it comes down to the last or final two drives, Arkansas is going to come out ahead every time because that's the kind of program that they've built from the ground up. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I love the fact that uh, whoever's running their social media, putting out these videos, they're doing a hell of a job. So we're yeah. going to kick it over to Sam Pittman, and then I'm going to cut in some of these videos too. Uh, I, I think Razorback fans will really like these. Sam, how did KJ and the other quarterbacks look today? Yeah, I was really, you know, that's probably the thing I was most excited about today was our quarterback's accuracy. You know, I thought KJ did a nice job in there, and and you you can go really down the line. I thought Malik had a good day. I thought uh, John Stevens Jones made some really good plays. Coley, Renfro, and and it was really exciting to see Landon Rogers today. You know, he made some really nice uh, long ball throws down the field and. And uh, with that, I think Jaden Wilson, the receiver, um, had a nice day too. It was good to see him catch some balls and get behind some some uh, defensive backs. We didn't get to watch a lot of practice, but the, one of the drills I was watching, AJ Green was last. I think he was being a rookie, last in line. How long do you think that'll continue? And how much progress has Raheem Sanders made in terms of getting comfortable playing running back? You know, I think you know when you're young, you you might believe that your place in line is last. You, you understand what I'm saying. And I think you know, that's probably, AJ, knowing him, that's probably a respect thing to the older guys out there. Um, I don't I don't anticipate him being the last running back we have, you know, but he did some nice things. I'm, I'm very um, excited about his knowledge. I mean, he's a smart kid. He learns fast. Uh, Rocket, it was nice to have him back full speed you know he had that high ankle injury in the in the spring ball and he toughed through it but we didn't I don't think we really got to see the true him he's 225 pounds and and uh, I think we've got something there and and uh, we'll have to find out but again I think the biggest thing Trey is we're, we're trying to find two first and um, two and three and then you know let them let them go sick sick them, you know, against uh, on Traylon Smith and see, you know, Smith would be a hard guy to beat out because he's, you know, so passionate and such a hard player. Now, look, I want you all to understand, we got talent. We got talent. Some teams don't have talent. We got talent, man. Do we have the mindset, the mental work ethic to use what we have talent-wise? Here's what I believe. I believe you all believe in us. And I believe, and I know we sure as hell believe in you. So I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. I'd be so disappointed if it wasn't true. But I believe that. So I believe that you're going to do whatever we ask you because you believe in us that when we go in that stadium, look, all we want to see you do, guys do is win and see your damn face in that locker room. That's all we want. We want success for you, right? Oh, yeah, and final thing there, just wanted to make a note that, uh, you know, Sam Pittman's been talking up, you know, the fact that they need someone to emerge there behind Traylon Smith and now that's the great thing about uh, running back Shane they can come in and contribute right away yeah and it sounds like they got two good ones in AJ Green Rocket Sanders he was a very touted recruit you know those are two names you got to put on your list now that uh, a lot of fans around the SEC may have no idea who AJ Green and Rocket Sanders are but look for them to be two of the the lead backs there in Fayetteville this year with a name like Rocket, Mike, he's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that since, what was that, Notre Dame, Rocket Ishmael? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, next up on the list, Shane, let's jump on down to Starkville. Mike Leach, uh, I think he was on the lawnmower here, but uh, wrapping up. <laughs> 
practice one there in Starkville. And, uh, you know, he didn't have a ton to say, but, uh, you know, very high on Jalen Wally. And I, I, the key for me here was his comments on uh, Will Rogers and just the growth he's had this off season. And, you know, I think if there was any debate kind of based on what Coach Leach had to say here, I think he's leaning heavily towards Will Rogers. Uh, they added the uh, Southern Miss transfer, Jack Abram, this off season, But certainly sounds like it's uh, Will Rogers' job, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so, man. And, and, and I mean, you could just kind of tell with the tone. And, it, and Coach Leach is one of those hard ones to follow, but mm -hmm. uh, I think this is his baby. And going into year two, I, I think we're going to lean hard on him. Yeah, and that's what you know. That's what all his offense is: is reps, reps, reps. I mean, that's yeah. Uh, when when he lit up LSU and Bo Pelini, that's what everybody was criticizing Bo Pelini for, saying, "Well, hell, this is the same exact plays he was running at Washington State." So uh -huh. it's not about mixing it up and getting exotic. That's not what Coach Leach does. He runs the same seven to <laughs> twelve <laughs> plays, and every uh, route has you know variations, of course, but. They read what the defense is doing. They adjust to it. And with players like Jaden Wally and Will Rogers running the show there, uh, not to mention their two outstanding running backs, uh, you know, I think Mississippi State, this is the year we see the Mike Leach in full effect uh, on that offensive side of the ball, don't you think? Yeah, I do. And, and like I said, I think it comes with Rogers at, at quarterback. And, and Will's kind of – don't quote me on this one, even though somebody may. I, I just – he's got this kind of – this is one of those quarterbacks that every year is going to be leading or up there with the SEC and yards passing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just going to happen. It's the Coach Leach system, and you're going to fall in love with this kid just like you have every Coach Leach quarterback. He's going to get to the NFL, and year two, they're going to be like, why the hell are we paying this guy? You know, <laughs> let's put him in a backup somewhere in Seattle. And then next thing you know, he just phases out. Because if you run the pirate system properly, you're going to look good. And I'm thinking that's what's going to happen with Will and some of these young receivers that really stepped up toward the end of season last year. And, and by the end of this season, I think you're going to look back and you say, hell, they got a hell of a quarterback down there. It's fool's gold for those NFL recruits. But I'm telling you right now, it's going to be great for the Mississippi State fans because it's going to win them a lot of games. Mm -hmm. And uh, last thing, just wanted to play his clips here from Leach, but – uh, I thought it was great that, uh, you know, he was asked who's standing out. And he said a lot of people, but the only names he threw out were defensive players. So Jordan Davis and uh, the safeties, Duncan and Peters there, uh, it certainly caught Coach Leach's eye. Any players stand out to you today or, or in the past couple of weeks coming into this? Uh, I, I, well, I guess there were a number of them. So I think that was pretty good news. You know, there was a number of them and, and uh, several guys, you know, had uh, – uh, did some impressive things and they kind of take turns on it and that's kind of what you want to see happen. Uh, I'd say Jordan Davis had a real good day. Um, I thought the two safeties, uh, Duncan and Peters, did. Jaden Wiley seemed to be full go today. Kind of where do you feel like that he is and do you feel like he's going to be full go for the season? Yeah, I mean, I pretty well summed it up. I can't add much to it. I thought he looked really good. What kind of leap are you expecting him to make this year? Uh, Wally? Yes. Uh, consistency. He's always been explosive. He's always been motivated. He always plays hard. Just precision, what he does. When do you want to start kind of dwindling those reps and getting them down to just a couple of guys? Like, how, what's that process like? <laughs> Shoot, I'd like to do that a year ago, but the thing <laughs> is, is, uh, you know, these guys change. They don't always stay the same, you know. And the good news is they usually improve. And, uh, so you got to keep peeking in on them and seeing what they're doing and then try to distribute uh, the reps. So, you know, the good news is, is uh, usually it's a result of improvement. Uh, you know, the bad news is, is you're uh, constantly trying to evaluate and, and uh, make the best decision you can. So, In that sense, how far has Will Rogers come in your mind from last fall practice to this point? I think leadership, he's come a long, long ways, uh, you know, as far as elevating the play of others. Uh, and then, you know, I think, well, he's, he's more consistent than uh, he obviously was starting as a true freshman without a spring. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, plenty of progress to make. Some of it's getting tuned in with your receivers, too. 
Obviously, with, with Will, we can see what he does here, you know, on the field. But in conversations with him and some meetings you guys have, I mean, do you kind of just see from talking to him that, that he's gained a little more knowledge of the offense from having that experience? Yeah, he's constantly watching film, constantly texting with questions and observations. Uh, you know, he, he works uh, uh, off the field probably more than anybody on the team. And I coaches' kids are like that too, though. You know, I mean, they're used to being around – film and evaluating and things like that and you know there's a point where you know I imagine they sit down to dinner in the Rogers household and besides pass the potatoes they uh, talk about football and things like that which I think is probably beneficial all right Jay so let's uh we got a new coach here we're trying our best to make this as entertaining as possible here but let's jump on down to the plains war damn eagle <laughs> Hey, he's a hell of a coach. We like we're just kidding around here, but wait, Mike, one uh, second. Let me get ready for this one here. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a hell of a record at Boise, and I'm sure he's going to do wonderful things there for the Auburn Tigers. But uh, it is a struggle to get uh, good clips here from uh, Brian Harson. We did our best, but uh, before we play him, Shane, what what are your thoughts on old old coach? Here's the deal, Mike. You don't have to win the podium. Look at Nick Saban. Even though we've we've come to like his grumpy ass over the years, <laughs> and it's it, that's that's what it's all about. It's about yeah. what you do on the field, and you know. So we don't need him to to come out with great clips every single week. But I'm going to tell you, it's really going to hurt him later if they don't get the victories because mm -hmm. they're going to keep drilling them down there in the plains. We've learned if we've learned anything about the media down there at Auburn is they will not sit on the <laughs> sideline and wait for their program to get better. They want it better now. Yeah, without a doubt. So let's get over to Coach, Coach Harson on uh, the competition there. That uh, you know that I like. I actually like these comments. It's just uh, the de the delivery I'm not in love with. But uh, you know, competition across the board because it's a new slate for everybody. And it's it's one thing to say that, but it certainly sounds like that's how it's playing out there at Auburn right now. Yeah. Uh, he was asked about uh, the offense with Mike Bobo, the, creating the Auburn offense as we speak. And uh, finally, on these receivers. I mean, they've got a ton of uh, receivers that are just kind of inexperienced. But uh, in the 2020 class, they signed four four-stars in uh, Capers, Kobe Hudson, J.J. Evans, Malcolm Johnson. Now it's time for those guys to shine. And uh, Coach Harson kind of drills down on uh, what exactly – they're doing to get the most out of those guys. Brian, for you, if you guys, you talked about competition a lot, but I guess I mean, everybody kind of focuses on quarterback, but you, you said, hey, every, everything's open, everything's a competition. How important is that going into really your first camp, but any camp to go, hey, everybody's got to battle and prove it? Well, well especially now, and, you know, there, there's not a three, four year history that we've had with players on this team. And I think every year, you get spring practice, you get an idea of where your team's at, and you get to give them, you know, two to three things to work on uh, going into the summer. So they get a little break and they go into the summertime, they're going to be working on those things. They're focused on new goals and expectations that they have for themselves going into that next season. Then they get the entire summer to work out, train, uh, to go through about 17, 18 practices that they run. And then we get them back in fall camp. So there's just there's so much growth and development that happens from when spring ends to when you start fall camp. And so we get guys out there. You got to let guys compete. I mean, there there'd be nothing more frustrating, in my opinion, to know that you have no shot um, coming into fall to go compete for a position. Every guy here wants to play. Every guy on this team wants to be on the field. Every guy wants to contribute. And so they're going to get their opportunities to do that. They got to make it count. And then eventually the guys that do better, they're going to get more opportunities. And the guys that don't, they're going to get less. And I think you got to give guys an opportunity to go out there and compete. And if anything, um, you create that competition in that room. I think it brings out the best in all the players. And at the same time, as a coach, you want to have depth. And competition creates that. So now if, if something happens or if a guy deserves to play, you try to find a role for him on the team so that he can contribute. And to me, that's, that's the fun part of having the chance to compete. And ultimately, at the end of uh, fall camp, you have a deadline, September 4th, and we're playing Akron. We get to go compete against Akron. So you want to be building 
that within your team, so when it's time to go out there and play, we all understand what that means. And you know, we get the best players on the field, the guys that have earned it and deserve it. Um, and that's really how things should be, right? You earn it, you get your opportunities, and, and you're the best, then you're going to have the chance to go out there and play and be on the field when it's game day. Brian, you said at uh, <clears throat> SEC Media Days that you thought the wide receivers were talented. You just had a lot of work to do with them because of the inexperience. What specifically are you looking for those guys uh, to do in fall camp to feel like you guys are going to be in your best spot to, uh, week one? Consistency every day. Showing up every day, um, preparing themselves every day, coming out to practice every day. You know, the wide receivers, for the most part, run more than anybody on the field. They're also on special teams. They do a lot of work, uh, but they got to have their minds right when they step out there and just know, like, that's part of um, the position that they play. And the details that they take from the meetings, uh, the application on the field, um, and then what they do in the evenings, especially in camp, coming back and reviewing that and studying it, like, you know, that's a position now. You've got to be a student of the game. And, and so when you watch really good wide receivers, I think one thing that stands out, they're, they're very consistent. Um, they're getting off the ball. They understand their adjustments. Um, they get lined up properly. There's not a lot of issues, you know, from really good wide receivers from that standpoint. Um, and I think, you know, the really, really good ones, they, they understand the game. And, and there's just critical moments in the game. It's... It's catching the ball, and it's in a two-minute drill and running it to the middle of the field. It's getting out of bounds. It's you know, being able to, to put yourself in a position based off coverage that's going to give us an advantage because you understand it. You paid attention in practice. You saw the looks that, that the defense was giving you, and you picked up on a few cues that, that help you stay ahead of, of what the defense is doing so you can respond properly when the ball snapped. And, um, that goes for a lot of positions, but that one in particular is is extremely important for us and, and what we're trying to accomplish in our offense. And, you know, those guys every day, they show up, they put in the work. Um, and, I, and I meant what I said, we got talented players in there. We got to be consistent every single day. We got to do it um, because we want to. And I think that group's got to, you know, get create that identity um, so that they're that type of unit. And, and those type of players that we, that we know we need in our offense. And, and they're capable of doing it. So, you know, to me, that's the key. And from what I saw this summer, uh, you know, a lot of really good work and a lot of those things are happening. Now I'm just looking forward to seeing that on the field when we go practice. Hey, and then uh, one point here, Shane, I wanted to make this comment here, but uh, let's give this guy credit here. Philip Marshall of uh, 24-7 Sports is mm -hmm. reporting that uh, starting defensive lineman Tyrone Truesdale, one of their – Better players, one of their veterans, made the decision to come back. His yeah. status, uncertain. He's not currently with the team. And, man, uh, for it. What? <laughs> Is that all we got? That's, this... all, that's all we got. Oh. Fa family matter, apparently. I don't know. No other information at this time. But uh, you're talking the anchor of the defense, senior leader here on the defensive line. And that's not a guy that Auburn is just going to be able to replace. So No. I don't know. That's that's not obviously how you want to start camp. Let's hope that uh, maybe this is nothing and he comes back very soon. But uh, just wanted to share that little nugget there. But uh, you know, not what you want. Like I said, just the, that's the last thing you want to hear when uh, you get a, a new coach. Uh, the players got to buy in, and I'm not yeah. certainly not suggesting he's not bought in. But I think it's easier for the rest of the players when uh, you know one of the one of the captains and seniors is is right there putting in the work. You know what? Yeah, Mike, but. We see this every time there's a new coach. There's some sort of fallout there in the locker room. We saw it with Arkansas. Mm -hmm. We saw it with Mississippi State last year. Yep. There's it just it, it takes a little while to catch fire in the locker room, and sometimes you've got to weed out the bad apples, even if they are your best players, because everyone looks up to them. That they are the team leader, and if they're bringing in negativity, then sometimes you got to cut. And I don't want to speculate because we don't know exactly what's going on. The kid may show up, but uh, uh, you hate to hear that as an Auburn fan, I would imagine. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, Shane, let's uh, jump it on down to Lexington. Mark Stoops met with the media here to open Kentucky camp, and of course, the big 
thing is, uh, you know, when are they going to make a decision on the quarterback and all that? Mm-hmm. But uh, I really like his comments, too, about, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of college football fans, and I'm particularly looking at uh, people like you, Shay, Tennessee fans who hate the transfer portal, wish it was never invented, robbed us of our <laughs> team. But on the flip side, if you're at Kentucky, if you have already laid the foundation and, you know, you're not having massive coaching turnover – the portal can really, really help you. And that's what the Wildcats took advantage of. I mean, they've got, you know, a quarterback from Penn State, a receiver from Nebraska, uh, a receiver from Michigan State. They've they've landed a, an offensive lineman from LSU and on and on and on. Um, for a program like Kentucky, the transfer portal can can really help. You know, if you got an, an issue or two you need to, uh, to, to address. And I think uh, Mark Stoops and company have kind of knocked it out of the park, bringing in – players that uh, are going to contribute right away. Yeah, I think Kentucky's the last program to want to get rid of the portal right now. They're sitting in a sweet spot and and because they've got a great track record. They they're taking some of these transfers and they're putting them into the NFL. That's that's why you see a lot of kids hit the portal because they're not getting the playing time. They're not getting exposure in their mind. They're not having the opportunities to go to the NFL when Kentucky can just roll the tape and say, "Hey, look what we did last year." Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay? So, come here play for a year, go on to the NFL, be a star in Lexington. Yeah, without a doubt. So let's kick it over to uh, Mark Stoops, his comments here. And like I said, I really liked uh, his comments with the, uh, it's better to get it right than to get it quickly at this quarterback position. That's something that uh, Kentucky has kind of found out the wrong way uh, in years past. So uh, Will Levis, Joey Gatewood, maybe even Bo Allen. Let's kick it over to Mark Stoops talking about this timeline. You know, I've, you know, through the years, you've heard me answer this, and I bet I answered it the same way. It's more important to get it right than, than to be in a hurry. Um, is there a benefit? Yes, I believe there is. Um, there's a benefit to getting reps. That's, that's part of the negative to having a lot of talented players um, at any position, but it seems like it's obviously much easier to, to rotate guys in throughout practice and preseason at other spots than quarterback. So uh, we do feel like there is, is quality depth. Um, you know, Maybe for the first time, you go all the way down and have four or five guys that you feel confident that could play football at this level. And getting them reps is a concern. And uh, we will uh, work that as best we can. Coach, transfers are really changing the game. Mm-hmm. Looks like we've got some good transfers in here. Yes, sir. Uh, really did. I feel like we got them in, in positions that uh, we needed some depth. Needed some depth, uh, obviously, and some some impact guys at wide receiver. We did that. Needed. You, know, you always need tackles. You know, we did that. Um, we got in a position with an early entrance to the NFL and then an injury at middle linebacker. We really solidified ourselves there. Um, so, and and obviously quarterback. Um, so we have some some really good players and uh, really hit some needs. So it was uh, very critical for us, and I feel very good about it. Mark, how's uh, JJ Weaver going to this rehab? Do you think he's going to be able to go? Yeah, JJ is ahead of schedule. He's working extremely hard. Um, you know, I stayed on JJ from day one. You know, just to continue, just to make sure he stayed up with that, starting with his range of motion and then his strength and all those things. And he's putting it together. Um, I, I don't know, you know what I mean? I, I don't want to force that. Um, he's doing a very good job, uh, but you also have to make sure you give that ligament time to heal. And um, he has a bright future. And I have a tendency to try to be more cautious with those type of guys than, than force them back into it. I also get the sense, Shane, that uh, Mark Stoops throw this out there and just say, stop asking me about the quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the question he hates more than any other, doesn't he? Yeah, man. It seems like it's it's a common theme up there right now, though. <laughs> so everybody wants to know who's going to be the quarterback. What's this program going to look like, you know? So I there's a few teams in the SEC I'm I'm – I'm anxious about week one mm-hmm. and I'm looking forward to the film and Kentucky's one of those programs because I expect a different offense. I expect the same defense. I expect a heavy running game, 
but I'm expecting a lot more through the air, and I want to see what that looks like. And most importantly, I want to see he's throwing the ball. So I'm right there with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final update, Shane. Let's jump it down to Nashville real quick. Uh, not a big, long clip or anything here, but uh, you know Vanderbilt has started their camp as well. And, and they didn't even hold a traditional press conference, but I did find these clips here of Clark Lee. And I thought it was very interesting, Shane, that uh, it's good, I think. It's certainly not saying it's bad, but uh, Ken Seals, for everything we've seen him do, I, I know he's only been there one year, but mm -hmm. he's been very impressive. And then out comes Mike Wright in the spring game, the backup, and he looked phenomenal. Now, yeah. what is that worth in a spring game? But according to all accounts, I mean, Mike Wright is a really good player too. So. I just think it's interesting that Vanderbilt is uh, splitting the rips, and uh, that's something that Clark Lee hits on here. The quarterbacks are going to share reps with the top Early on here, I, uh, the, the length of time will be just according to where, where it kind of separates out. But early on, we're going to see, you know, it's about establishing some chemistry and, and not only just with the one group of quarterbacks, but also with the receivers too. So they're going to split time to make sure each person gets a chance to compete. But as soon as it starts to separate, we'll, we'll, that'll show up on the field too. How would you say Ken and Mike have progressed in spring since you've had? Uh, you know, I mean, they, they both have matured as leaders. They both matured in the way they trained in the summer. I think we'll look at practice film to see, you know, where the reads are right and not. I mean, both of them made throws in place today. But um, I wouldn't want to, you know, pass judgment just yet until we, we have a chance to see it. How wild would it be if, uh, you know, for all, all the jokes and everything, but uh, Vanderbilt may have two good quarterbacks, mm. whereas some programs in the SEC don't have any, uh, yet Vanderbilt's got so many issues. But, hell, the, the most important position on the field may be their biggest strength. Yeah, and that's and that's a kind of a Vanderbilt track record, in my opinion. It's like every three or four years – emerges a guy that's going to lead the program for the next three years, a Jay mm -hmm. Cutler esque top quarterback. Sure. That makes was another one. Sure. Absolutely, man. That just makes Vanderbilt competitive and, and just about every game they're in that right now, do they have the, the talent to go toe to toe with a lot of these teams? No, but how do you equalize that by quarterback play and Vanderbilt does have two pretty good ones back there. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, hey, Shane, we've been spieling on a long time here. This will be the longest podcast uh, <laughs> of 2021 here. And, uh, I man, I, can, I cannot uh, wait to see what we come up with as uh, – as we get closer and closer to the season. Yeah, I, I finally get back on here. You go full Rogan on me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hang out for three hours. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad to be back, Mike. Um, you know, this is going to be a regular occurrence. And uh, I can't, I'm can't. i looking forward to the video. I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of curious what filters you throw on there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the growth. I'm excited about this season. It's going to be a fantastic fantastic year i could already feel it um and man i'm just so happy that that the fans really I, a lot of them have been reaching out and think helping us out and uh you know if you if you see it on twitter and you want to retweet the pod you know get that get that out there for us and maybe somebody in your line that's looking for an sec podcast uh you know word of mouth is how we've been doing it up to this point but i appreciate everything you've done mike uh this, it be we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the work that you've put in. Yeah, and the work has just begun, my friend. Like I said, fully on board, nothing but the podcast from here on yep. out. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. It's kind of like that, <laughs> that Will Ferrell from uh, Office, uh, from the Office. You know, could be the worst decision you ever made. <laughs> could be a good decision. You want to play some Russian roulette? Hey, that's what we're doing. Or at least that's what I'm doing. So, uh, hey, if the if the podcast ceases to exist here in a month, you, I'm probably dead in a ditch. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, it's gonna be a great year, Mike. I can feel it. But all right, hey, I appreciate you, Shane, for hopping on the line and and bearing with through it with all these clips. And uh, I appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out. We'll catch you on the next one. All right, see you guys. Go Vols.